Praise the Lord, everyone. We welcome you this morning to the First Apostolic Church, and we welcome you back to our live feed this morning. Uh, we do apologize. We've had some technical uh, difficulties this morning, um, and with uh, limited staffing, the guy who needed to fix it was on the piano, so uh, we needed to take a short break, get things fixed, but we're back, and we've got a mind of worship this morning, and we're so, so very thankful to have you join us today on this uh, bright and sunny Pentecost Sunday where that we celebrate uh, not only the prior resurrection of our Lord, but we pour, we celebrate the outpouring of His Spirit upon mankind today. And we're thankful to have you with us. We're going to join back in worship this morning. We invite you to worship with us today. And uh, we're just certainly praying that there's no more technical difficulties today and we can just have church. Thank you for joining us this morning. Let's worship together.
Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Why don't you just make your living room a tabernacle of praise this morning. Jesus, we love you today. We're thankful for your mercy this morning. We're thankful for your grace. Thank you for all that you've done for us. We honor you today and we praise you in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us this morning. We're going to take our prayer request before the Lord today and ask the Lord to touch these needs. We I want to remember Sister Tiffany Perkins this morning as she's traveling tomorrow for safe travels. <clears throat> we uh, want to remember Pastor and his family. They are in Nashville, Tennessee today preaching for Pastor Batson. And uh, we know that they are going to be blessed today and we pray for uh, the Lord's safety and protection upon them. Uh, I did speak to him last evening. Uh, rioting had broke out in certain parts of Nashville but he assured me that they were safe and they were okay. But we, uh, we still, do, still want to remember them in prayer. Uh, as well as across our nation today, let's remember the United States of America this morning. <clears throat> we uh, <clears throat> have many, many things going on across this nation that, that are troublesome. Uh, even beyond the coronavirus pandemic, uh, things have broke out, as I'm sure if you've Seeing the news to any measure, you're aware that there's certain things going on. Violence is begetting violence today, and we know that God is a peacekeeper this morning, and uh, we, we honor him for that, and we're so thankful. Let's pray this morning and ask God to minister upon every need and every circumstance today. Jesus, in your mighty name this morning, we come before you today, and we're so thankful, Lord, for an opportunity to be in your house we're thankful, Lord, for every person that's able to join us this morning by way of the World Wide Web. God, and, and in the, as the, the people of that congregation of this church and assembly this morning, we ask you, God, to touch and bless them, Lord, minister to them, meet every need today, heal, heal the sick, touch and bless our elders this morning. God, minister, Lord, to those that might be suffering stress and anxiety because of today's problems and issues. God, we know that you're a peacekeeper we know that you're a way maker this morning, God, and we depend on you. We're asking you, Lord, to, to send your spirit, Lord, and let it dwell upon man. Let it dwell upon the, the people of this assembly and strengthen them and their spirits today. Touch Sister Perkins, Lord, as she travels tomorrow, Lord, and, and whatever this need is, God, you're able to go before her and make every crooked way straight. Touch Pastor and his family. Bless them as they're in service this morning with Brother Batson. Bless that assembly today, Lord. Minister through the word of God, Lord, and, and here locally in this community, we ask you, God, to allow us to be a blessing this morning, God, and we not fail to praise you, Lord, and give you glory and honor for it today, in the lovely name of Jesus, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen. Worship with us this morning as we continue to celebrate Jesus today in our worship.
Amen, amen, amen. Aren't you thankful that he's the one true God this morning? Why don't you lift your hands and just praise him and give him thanksgiving today? Thank you for who you are today. Thank you for who you are, Lord. We love you. We love you. We love you. We're so appreciative of you. We're so, we honor you today. We honor you today. Amen, amen. While you're preparing for an offering this morning, uh, additional comments come in on our Facebook page this morning as we were praying. Sister Brenda Trout said she wants us to keep her in our prayers as she's going to a liver specialist to check on her liver and see if things are getting worse or if they're if they're not getting worse. And we need to we need to pray for her that God would minister in her life, touch the pain, uh, remove it, restore her to the fullness of health today. Sister Brenda, we're praying for you this morning and your family, and we want you to know that this church is behind you, and we love you today. And uh, we're praying for God to just minister great results there. I think if you're a, a member of First Apostolic Church this morning, you probably know the drill at this point. But we're going to give you a ton, an opportunity to take up an offering today. Uh, give by way of, of tithely, or if you're writing out your check to stick in an envelope this morning, we want to allow you an opportunity to worship in a manner of giving to the kingdom of God this morning. So uh, let's, let's do that this morning. We'll pray. Mighty God, we're so thankful for you. We're thankful, God, that you've blessed this church, Lord, and that we're able to still continue here. Lord, we're asking you, God, to go before us today and minister, Lord, by way of worship and financial needs for the kingdom of God. Touch your people today, Lord, that they will give, Lord, and that you will give back to us, pressed down, shaken, and get together and running over this morning, Lord, and we'll not fail to give you praise for that. In Jesus' name, give unto the Lord today. people said amen this morning. Amen. Amen. We're so thankful that you've joined us today. And if you're just now joining us, we are here this morning worshiping and celebrating an opportunity to be in the presence of God today. And we're so thankful for that this morning. Amen. <clears throat> just a reminder to our uh, FAC family this morning that today is fifth Sunday. So we are having our AM service only this morning, and uh, we uh, bid you an opportunity to uh, spend time in fellowship with your family this evening and, uh, and get some, some good R&R. Amen. I want to turn your attention this morning to the word of the Lord in the book of Ephesians, chapter number 5. <clears throat> the book of Ephesians, chapter 5. We're going to begin at verse number 22. We're going to, uh, for this Bible lesson this morning, our focus is going to be on the Christian family. And, uh, you know, the Word of God says a great deal about the home and the relationship of its family members. The divine order of the family is often ridiculed and misunderstood by the world. Constantly changing trends of today, philosophies of the world are often contrary to biblical principles. And what I want to talk about this morning, and, and hopefully we can, we can uh, move swiftly and get through this today in, in one setting, uh, but I want to talk about the Christian family, of course, from a biblical point of view. Our first scripture reading, this is my, my commercial disclaimer today, our first scripture reading is not uh, the complete total tone of what this lesson is going to be about. Uh, so all you ladies uh, of the church can say, God bless you, amen. Uh, because this first verse is often, often misquoted and misunderstood and is often abused, and we'll, we'll get to that at a later point. But it's still a verse in the Bible that has merit 
and it's still something that uh, has intention and place in God's family today. Uh, as, you're, as you're preparing your, your Bibles this morning, I just want to say before we move on that uh, I love and appreciate our bishop this morning and, and Sister McGee. I know you're watching this morning on uh, your, your, your phones or whatever you have, and we're so thankful for you, and we love you and appreciate you today. Uh, I honor my pastor this morning. I know he is busy working behind a pulpit today himself, uh, but uh, in the chance that he will see this at a later date, uh, Pastor, I want you to know that I respect you and I honor you today. Um, I know as a business leader how difficult it is to navigate what we've been doing for the last eight to ten weeks, and my decisions are based on people's livelihoods. And while that's important, I understand today that pastor's decisions and direction is based on people's eternity, and that's a, that's a different dimension altogether, and I do not envy him, and I honor him today and love and appreciate him. The book of Ephesians, chapter number 5, if you're there, say amen. I, I think I heard it. Verse number 22, the Bible says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. This is a little bit of a lengthy reading this morning, but just bear with me. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth it and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Turning now directly into the reading of the next chapter in verse 1, chapter 6. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment, with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. We're talking about the Christian family this morning. Amen, amen. And if, if, you are, if you are standing for the reading of the word in your tabernacle living room this morning, you may be seated. God bless you. The Christian family today. I want to start, start with a brief introduction of our setting this morning. God's scriptural order for the family is based upon a divine fundamental principle. And it is very simple if we will pay attention to it today. It is that each person prefer the other more than himself or herself. Romans chapter 12 and verse number 10 says, Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love in honor preferring one another. The phrase in Romans 12.10, preferring one another, means to show deference to or even to submit to. And I, I realize, and I, I'm, I'm sensitive and I want to be careful to this today, I realize that the word submission in the 21st century has been uh, classified a bit of a dirty word and we don't like to talk about it and, and when people use the word submission, Shoulders shift and, and body language changes and people cringe. But I, I'm not coming to you today with submission in reference to 
what we believe submission is, but I'm coming to you today with submission in terms of what the Word of God tells us is necessary. Uh, not, not, this is not my idea today. This is God's Word, and it's healthy for us. This principle of preferring one another is not necessarily a popular one. Nor is it, unfortunately, if we're honest with ourselves today, we'll admit that it's not practiced much in society. It's practiced by some, but by and large, it's not practiced by the greater population. If, if, I, if I turn to modern day uh, activities, current events that are happening just this past week, for just a moment and respectfully reflect on some things that I've seen in the news media. If preferring one another was popular, if preferring one another was something that was commonplace, we would not see stores like Target in Minneapolis, Minnesota, uh, loitered and, and run over with people going in to, to just grab uh, merchandise by the arm loads and literally running out the door in thievery and stealing things because for some reason our society believes that if you want to protest the violence of, the, of a murdered man, which is horrific, I say nothing today to support that. I say nothing today to take away from the hor horrifying nature of those circumstances. And I will declare to you that our stance as the first apostolic church today is not one that is, that is built on racism, but we are one church, we are one people, we are one human and mankind and we are created by one God today Whew, hallelujah and, 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 and we are one people today but as horrifying as that circumstance is this morning for some reason our society thinks that if you want to protest violence then protest violence with more violence and for some reason people aren't understanding the contradictory nature of that and, and, and they're not getting it so with that frame of reference today I offer to you this morning that preferring one another, deferring to someone else, submitting to others. It's not popular in society today. However, however, society's popular in somewhat as they proclaim enlightened position and philosophies on family relationships have led to nothing but millions of divorces, broken homes, latchkey kids, children raised by one parent. No disrespect to anyone today who might be in those type of conditions, but that is a byproduct of our society and where we have come from in days, decades, years gone by behind us for not preferring one another. Somebody in God's family say amen this morning. So we have a choice to make. We have a choice to make. To either, and it's really one of two things. And sometimes there's things in life that aren't this simple, but this is really very basic this morning. We have a choice to make. We either adopt the world's philosophies on family relationships, or we accept God's principles and we rely upon Him to build our home. He from whom which the home was first built back to Adam and Eve. Psalm 127 in verse number 1 today says, Except the Lord build the house, they build in vain. They labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. So God's plan for the family, God's plan for mankind can be seen in our scripture reading passage today in Ephesians chapter 5, beginning at verse number 22, the Bible teaches us that although the roles of husbands and wives and children are very different from each other, they are equally important. Now, allow me, if you will, a moment to just say that one more time because I want to make sure that we, we all got it and, and, and that we, 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 we get it clearly today. The roles of the husband and the roles of the wife and the roles of our children are different from each other. 
Pop culture doesn't teach this. Uh, our, our, our high school teachers don't teach this. Colleges and universities don't teach this. They teach that we are one and the same. Feminism teaches that the woman can do anything that the man does. And, and, but when I look at what the Bible's principles are this morning, that we each have a unique role. Now, now hear me. Hear me here. Don't turn the channel just yet, please. I'll, I'll give you a commercial break later and an opportunity to change the channel if you desire. But, but stay with me for a moment because I want you to understand today that our roles are different. That does not mean one is, diff one is better than the other. Now, if we go back to my beginning disclaimer about our first verse of Scripture that starts off with wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands, that's usually where people turn the channel. Because that verse, I, I will, I will uh, uh, acquiesce to admit this morning that that verse has been abused, that verse has been misquoted, that verse has been quoted by, by, by ignorant men. Okay? All right, all the ladies say amen this morning. It has been misquoted by ignorance. It's not a dirty word. That's a word whose root word means to ignore or overlook something. Ignorant men have quoted that verse and said, Well, wife, you're supposed to submit. You do what I say. That's not what the Bible's telling us. It's telling us that we each have a unique role. I cannot do, and I'm, I'm, I'm delaying my, my passage forward here, but let me just say, I cannot fulfill my wife's role in our relationship. My wife, as talented as she is, as great as she is, cannot fulfill my role in the home. Now, if I, if I take just a common sense perspective of this for just a moment, because I'm a simple guy, I would say that, the, that if I could fulfill my wife's role, or if my wife could fulfill my role, why do either of us need the other? Why did God form Eve out of the rib of Adam? if Adam didn't need Eve to give him something that he could not give himself. For our roles are different this morning. But they are equally, hear me, hear me, hear me now. Uh, I hope you haven't turned the channel on me yet. They are equally important. If we desire God's blessings in life, then we must also submit to God's plan in that area of life. Moses gave a choice to the people of Israel. In Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse number 27, the Bible says a blessing. Watch this now. Watch the wording. The wording is very specific. A blessing. If ye obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you this day, Verse number 28, and a curse, options one, option two, a curse if you will not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside out of the way which I command you this day to go after other gods which you have not known. Well, that's, that's pretty cold. Well, maybe by our modern day perspectives it might be. Because contrary to what pop culture teaches us today, they're, they're really in, in, in the eternal framework and perspective with God and His Word. There isn't a gray area. There, there isn't a compromising middle of the road line to walk. It is truly in God's kingdom. It is black and white. It is left or right. It is right or wrong. And here Moses, at the instruction of Almighty God, is giving a decree to the people of Israel that they have a choice in the matter, that either a blessing or a curse, and the only thing that separates them is obedience. That is what separates them today. This is also the admonition of the Apostle Peter that he gives to us, instructing us that we should be obedient to God's Word and not fashion 
our lifestyle or behavior according to the world out of which we've been delivered. 1 Peter chapter number 1 in verse 13 says, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance. But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. This world has its own philosophies and traditions concerning relationship. And the Apostle Peter is telling us here, if I summarize, that our conversation determines our behavior. Our conversation determines our behavior. The tone of our conversation is a predictor of our behavior. You don't see someone yelling at someone who's happy. Yelling in anger tone. You don't see people crying and depressed that are saying happy things. Their, their, their words that they choose, the way that they say them, their conversation is a predictor of their behavior. The kingdom of God has an arrangement and an order for us to follow. And he said, be ye holy for I am holy. If we make those choices, the divine order of the family today, according to the word of God, <clears throat> is Jesus Christ, the husband, the wife, and then the children. If we look at this according to God's word, and we look at this even in organizational structure manner, again, remember earlier, I said very clearly, each role is unique and different, but all are equally important. But organizationally, the way God has set up the structure of the home is Jesus, and then the husband, <clears throat> and then the wife. And then the children. That is the Bible formula for the order of the family. One reason why this has gotten, in my opinion, one reason why this has gotten so much negative press in our day is because of we, we, we tend sometimes to judge the exceptions as the rule. And there are people who, there are husbands who use that as an opportunity to usurp authority over the wife and treat the wife as though she's a child. That's not God's divine order. It's not God's divine order that a husband remind his wife that she's under subjection. Because if he follow Christ and be under subjection to him, he won't have to. It's also why finding the right spouse matters. That's a lesson for a different day. There are homes outside of the divine order of the family where the husbands and the wives have swapped roles. And the wife is more submitted to God than the husband is. And the wife is leading the home and the husband is just trailing after. That's also not God's divine order. Then there are homes where the husband and wife have both surrendered their roles of authority to the children. And whatever the children say go, whatever the children want they get, whatever the children do is okay. Never mind the authority roles of the husband and wife. I, I will never understand, I will never understand 
parents who say, I just don't know why they do that when they've never given their children the courtesy of the word no. Amen. That's not God's divine order. Let me tell you something. It's all I can do to keep my mouth shut sometimes, and I'm working on it after 40-something years. I'm getting a little bit better, but I've not made it yet. I've still got work to do. But it's all I can do to keep my mouth shut whenever I hear people say that their 7-year-old daughter or son is their best friend. That's not God's divine order. Now, I know as, as children grow up into adults, the, the parent-child relationship goes through a metamorphosis of types, and, and there are deeper friendship-level friends that are built because the relationship is different. But when you are an authority figure and you're in God's divine order, it's not God's purpose for you to be their friend. It's God's purpose for you to be their parent. It's God's purpose for you to say no when it's appropriate. It's God's purpose for you to say don't do that again when it's appropriate. And to support that this morning, I'll quote a scripture that I did not write, but it is a God's word that says if you spare the rod, you spoil the child. Let's move on. God's divine order of the family this morning. Jesus, husband, wife, children. Let's talk about Jesus and his headship and his lordship in our families. Lord, I'm only on page five. We've got a long way to go and a short time to get there. Jesus is Lord of all. There is nothing, no matter how hard they try, there is nothing that anyone can do to supersede his authority and his power. Understanding the absolute lordship of Jesus Christ is crucial to our understanding of his divine order of the family because if a husband, hear me, hear me, men, we've got Father's Day coming up. This will give you a precursor to Father's Day, maybe. I don't know. I'm not the speaker then. But let, let, me, let me just tell you something. If you aren't surrendered to God, then the ordering structure of your entire home is out of whack. Because everything starts with Jesus. And the responsibility of that rests on the shoulders of the men in the home. Woo! That's good, even if I did say it. We have, we have to understand the absolute lordship of Jesus Christ. We're not in charge of our own lives. He is. Acts 10 and 36 says the word which God sent unto the children of Israel preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. Colossians reads 118 and he, Jesus Christ, he is the head of the body, the church who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. He gave his life for the church, demonstrating the highest form of love. We celebrate this. I hope we celebrate it more often than this, but we really focus on this at, at resurrection time, the agape love of God, that self-sacrificial love where he loved the church before there was ever a church. He loved, I don't know why he did, but he loved Jerry Mason before I was ever spoken into existence. He gave his life for that church that we might be born, both fleshly born and born again of the water and of the Spirit. Romans 5 and 8 says, But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners... Christ died for us. 1 John 3.16 says, Hereby perceive we the love of God because He laid down His life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for 
the brethren. Jesus has the preeminence in all things. So we, we as family members, we as husbands and wives and children, starting first with the husband, according to the word of God, the, the, the essence of responsibility is to acknowledge and submit to Jesus Christ's absolute authority and headship and lordship in our lives. And when we do that, blessings follow for our family. <clears throat> we can be sure today that because of his unquestionable love for us, his blueprint for the family will not harm us. It will bring to us the best possible good for our lives. I might be getting a little bit ahead of myself, but let me tell you something today. Uh, there, there's a whole, I don't stand before you today uh, as someone who, who, who has got it all right and every time and got it all figured out. Uh, I'm telling you what the Word of God says, and this applies to me as much as it does you. Uh, I still have to tie my shoes when I put them on. Uh, I, 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 there's nothing supernatural about, about me but I can tell you the things, the times and things that I feel like we have gotten right, my wife and I together in our family unit have gotten right, they matter. I can remember a time <clears throat> driving home from a revival weekend of, of preaching out of town. It's about 4.30 in the morning. My wife was driving and uh, I was laying over in the seat trying to, 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 I wasn't trying to sleep. If you know me, you know I was sleeping and, uh, and probably really not having too much difficulty with it. But we pulled in, we're about a mile away from home. And at about 4.30 in the morning, a, a four, three, four or five year old Alex is in the back seat. And he just starts singing. And he starts singing a song that neither of us even knew that he knew the lyrics to. It was one of the sweetest moments I think I've ever experienced in my entire life. I don't believe that moment would have happened if there hadn't been a divine order following in our home. If you fast forward five or six years later to a, a 10 or 11 year old Alex, I don't even know where we were going, but we were driving down the road and just almost seemingly out of nowhere, he says... Mom, Dad, do you think someday I can do what you do at church and lead worship? Uh, yeah, <laughs> I think was our response. Out almost For us, it was out of left field. For him, he had probably been pondering on that for quite some time. Listen, if you fast forward another decade... That's why he's on a piano this morning singing and worshiping and praising God. It's because somewhere a group of parents got it right. <coughs> I've messed up more than I've ever gotten it right. I assure you that. But when we get it right, it matters. I'm telling you husbands and wives, it matters for your children's sake. Amen. Let the church say amen biblical role of the Father. As I surveyed this passage of Scripture, I find, and I, I, I didn't count it, I almost did. I, I, I kind of wish I had, but you know, we, we lead in with that verse that just immediately out the gate, boom, wives, it singles out our ladies. But if I survey this passage of Scripture, I believe it really deals with the man more than it does the wife. Because that's where the responsibility starts. And the success, hear me husbands, I say this with love this morning, but the success of your wife also somewhat in part depends on you. Your leadership, your investment Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 25. <clears throat> Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, 
but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as, hear this now, as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord, the church. The Christian husband is repeatedly instructed to love his wife. These scripture verses make an exclusive use of the Greek word agape which we already covered from a resurrection reference this morning, is a selfless, self-sacrificial, giving type of love. Now, how you give may look different for you than it does me. This is is not a cookie-cutter formula, but it is in your relationship giving according perhaps even to your love language that God has designed for in your life for each other. The Bible uses Scripture, the, uses Jesus Christ and His relationship with the church as a role model for the husband's relationship for the wife. How did Jesus demonstrate His love, His agape love? The same type of love referred to in the husband-wife model here. He considered the church's needs before his own. He gave his own life for the church. He guides his church firmly in love, strongly and resolutely, but with care and gentleness. He continually protects his church, provides for his church, nurtures his church, and cherishes his church. The New Testament And I've already alluded to this, and I want to be more plain about it here now. The New Testament writing never, never, never gives the husband the right to be selfish, to operate in tyranny, to be overbearing, cruel, or oppressive. All traits of men that I have seen in my lifetime behave and be toward their spouses all under the guise of Ephesians 5.22, wives submit. I'm telling you today, that's ignorance. But the Bible teaches the exact opposite. Everything a husband does should emanate out of his deep love and concern for his wife and his family. The biblical husband puts his wife and his family first. Again, we see the underlying principle here on display, preferring one another. The husband is also to charge, is to is charged to honor and esteem his wife. First Peter three seven says, "Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel." And I want to point out here: it says weaker, not weak, because women and wives, and I know speaking personally for my wife today, she's one of the strongest individuals I know. This does not say weak vessel, but weaker. And that's God's wording. And as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. There is an inference here in the wording that tells me that if I don't do this, that my prayers to God will be hindered. And if I rephrase that in my own wording today, maybe God won't hear me with as much clarity as He would if I've got the divine order, if I don't have the divine order of family right in my home. But if I'm following Him and my wife is coupled with me according to God's formula, then God will hear me. The scripture specifically teaches us that the husband should live with his wife. That's probably something we need to teach in this day and hour. Endeavoring to understand her, knowing who and what she is, and being aware of her needs. And I might just say, because I've messed this up so many times in the last 26 years, I might just say that part of that process 
isn't altogether about getting it right as much as it is trying. Learning. I can tell you after 26 years, I, I hope, I, I, she's here with me this morning, and I'm not going to look over at her while I say this right now, but I hope after 26 plus years of marriage today that, that she can say that I've improved in some of these areas and that I've grown from the 19-year-old version of myself a day or two ago. I haven't always gotten it right, and I'll probably still mess it up, but I'm going to keep trying. That's the spirit, gentlemen. That's what I believe that God is looking for. He should treat his wife gently and tenderly as he would treat a treasure. Relationships are fragile. Love, trust, and respect are difficult to regain after they've been lost. Not impossible, but difficult. The husband should carry the weight of burdens and responsibilities that the wife is unable to bear and not place undue burdens and obligations on her. Because of his lack, the husband and wife are co-heirs of God's grace. They're equal inheritors of God's heritage. If the husband does not honor and treat his wife with correct respect and esteem, his prayers will be hindered, cut off, stopped. The behavior of the husband toward his wife should be characterized by respect and dignity, showing genuine appreciation of her, something my wife and I have never, never engaged in is criticizing one another. We might, we might prod at each other, but we don't criticize or joke about each other to other people. I've seen some, it was, it was a roast fest for both parties, husband and wife, just constantly roasting one another and I have to pause and wonder sometimes if when they're saying it, even though they're laughing, is there some measure of truth to it? I want to caution you today. It's dangerous. Even if you are sincere and have the best of interest, and that's your way of, uh, of, of, of communicating, which I don't, I don't know why that would be, but if it is, you need to understand that there's, there's, there's risk involved. There's danger involved there. Christian husband is instructed to recognize his wife as a virtuous woman of valuable treasure. Proverbs chapter 31 and verse number 10, and I'm going to uh, start uh, landing the plane here, and I'll close with, with this verse of Scripture, and we'll earmark the rest of this uh, perhaps for a future date. Um, but Proverbs 31 and 10 says, Who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above rubies. The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her so that he shall have no need of spoil. You know why there's such mistrust in relationships today? It's because there's no divine order followed in the structure of the home. We need the order of the home. Christian family is important. It's the framework on which this country was built. There are people today trying to argue those facts, but it is still a fact. It is a historical fact. It is the framework on which this country was built, but even beyond the United States of America in our infancy compared to other countries around the world, it is the framework on which God built the family. And that shall forever rest in eternity today. The Christian family. We're today spending time talking about the husband. We didn't even get done with the husband. Guys, you, 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 you're troublemakers. You, you, you require a whole lot of, of effort to clean up, and I say that because I am one. And uh, we get it wrong a lot of times, but let's just not stop trying today. What do you say? Amen. The Christian family, thank you, thank you so much for being in the house of the Lord with us today. Let's take our attention to God in prayer for just a moment and ask the Lord to... To, to minister to us through his word. Mighty God, we love you today. We're so thankful to have had the opportunity to be in your house this morning. We're thankful, God, for your spirit, your presence. We're thankful for the worship. Lord, we're thankful that you're still able to minister to this congregation even through technical difficulties. You're still God. and We can still worship and we'll still prevail and move on. We thank you, Lord, for your grace and your, 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 the energy and the investment that you put in us today. Seal this word in our heart today, God. Help us to grow. 
we're not here reflecting on our perfections. But God, we stand before you, Lord, and we see clearly what our, what our imperfections are. And we're asking you, God, to just apply your grace one more time and help us. We ask it in the name of Jesus. Bless this church congregation and those that are visiting with us this morning. We ask you your blessings to be upon them this week in their lives. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. The Bible says we walk by faith, not by sight. God bless you. Have a great and wonderful week. In Jesus' name.